first ever female Arab African in space. I am on this planet to explore space, almost like I wasn't allowed to dream about this. The sky's the limit, but you've kind of been there and done that. What was space like? <laughs> That's a really good question, honestly. Thank you very much. A lot of people were having issues believing that this was happening, so a lot of people thought it was fake. Going to space kind of breaks your reality. The media wants to show you the bad things. They don't want to show you the good things. Can we can we save this planet? You don't want to discourage everyone and say that the Earth is doomed. Scariest moments you face. Mm, that's a little bit weird. I'm going to yeah. pretend I know what you're talking about. So <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to the Inside Track with me, Luca Alam. I am delighted to welcome Sarah Sabri. She's an astronaut, she's an engineer, and she's an entrepreneur. I'm going to space. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you, Luca. Thank you so much for having me. It's not very often that I get to meet astronauts. Yeah. Talk, talk, talk to me about that. <laughs> You're an astronaut. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, it's been it's been an insane journey, to be honest. How did yeah. it, how did it start for you? Honestly, I got into the space field just because I was very curious about everything yeah. about the origins of life, about astrophysics. I really wanted to understand what was it going on yeah. you know and the more you try to find answers the more you're left with bigger questions okay so i kind of um, told myself well i need to do something about it and yeah. that's how it all started it's just look there's so many things i want to ask you it's just crazy you're an astronaut like i used to think as a kid we all used to do it right? i used to dress up and put the big uh, the big big helmet on the big jumpsuit on whatever and we also always to pretend and you actually went and lived that childhood dream mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible did you always know you wanted to be an astronaut from such a young age? Not really, honestly, because in, I grew up in Egypt and in Egypt, we're not really exposed to the space field. We don't watch rocket launches. And if you ever try to dream about something like this, you're always told it's not for you. Yeah. It's not for our side of the world. Yeah. So it was almost like I wasn't allowed to dream about this. But yeah. growing up, I wanted to, um, I used to always tell my parents I wanted to be an inventor. I wanted okay. to do something new. I wanted to kind of, you know, change what we know is real. Yeah. So that's what I always strive for. So for those who don't know, Sara is the first ever female Arab African in space, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. When did you go to space? August 4th. 2022. Last year, 2022. Years passed, give or take. How are we feeling about it? Does it does it still feel a bit surreal? Does it feel like it actually happened or can you still remember it very vividly? Yes, I do remember it very vividly. I think because also because of the purpose of my mission it was really important for me to process the whole experience and to really make sense of it. And because as an engineer, whenever you're feeling weird about something, I had to write it down into bullet points. So it really forces you to visualize it yeah. again and again. And yeah. what you saw, why, like every, all the parts of it and try to really understand how yeah. it's changed you. So yeah, I really, it's just, you know, the, the, the earth, you know, just that image is just so crisp. It's yeah. just so clear in my head. Yeah. Every time you close your eyes, you can be brought back into yeah. that specific moment. It's like you can't unsee it. But you mm. just, once, you know, once you've seen that. Do you know, is, I mean, I don't know the answer. Do you, you might. Do you know how many people have actually been into space? Different people. Yes. Around 630 something. Wow. That's a, an, a very elite group of people that you've joined. Unfortunately. 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 And uh, how, many, how, how many people from this region, both male or female, have been to space? From the, well, two Saudis um, went to the space station. And yeah. one of them is a woman. She's the yeah. first Saudi woman to go to space. Amazing. Which is really, really exciting. We're finally having more representation. At the International Space Station right now, today, we have three Arabs. Two wow. Saudis and one Emirati. It's amazing. Which is insane to think about growing up. That was not the case, yeah, you know? Yeah. It was only US or Russia or a few people from Europe. Yeah. And now we're really seeing, finally seeing people from our side of the world do It's this. a proud moment, right? It's a very proud it moment. Is. So it is. I'm, I'm, I wanna know, uh, there's so many things I wanna ask you. Um, <laughs> I don't really know where to start, but <laughs> actually I, I kinda do. What was space <laughs> like? <laughs> um, space is very big and Honestly, I think there's one thing that is that stayed with me, with me 
before going to space, I think when I was told that I was going to space, I think two weeks before my actual flight, I was looking up from my car, looking up at the sky, and it was during the day. And for me, it felt so surreal that I would be flying yeah. up there and leaving the skies. Do you remember basically. what day it was of the week? Um, or do these details, just you just forget about it because it's like, you know. No, because I found out that I was going to space about two weeks before going. Oh, wow. So everything happened really fast. And okay. I was in Egypt at the time, helping the Egyptian Space Agency with a few things. And I'll tell you about the whole announcement because it's so crazy how the universe works. And um, so, yeah, it happened really, really quickly. So I remember like in that one moment when I was trying to process things in the car and, you know, they asked me also to take some video journal. So I was taking some video journal in the car. So I was really trying to, um, to like take it in, but it felt so crazy and the sky felt so huge. And for me, it felt like, how am I, this tiny little human being, yeah. going to be flying up so high? Yeah. And um, it felt just like, you know, you have this moment of, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. Yeah. But after coming back, the sky does not feel as big anymore. Yeah. It feels so small. It's really a lot more manageable, yeah. a lot more... Tangible. Tangible, well, yeah, yes. As well. yeah. do, do, do you, do you, did your perspective change once you came Definitely. back? Um, on the world, on life, on, on everything, really? Everything, everything. Your relationship with everything changes. Even with your work, with objects, with people, with your surrounding, with earth you know, with space, yeah. all of it changed. And to be honest, there is this term called the overview effect, which is- the, oh, So what, what effect? The overview effect. Okay. So a lot of astronauts throughout the years have been talking about this, have been talking about this feeling that you get after coming back from space. So there's Frank White, he's termed, he's come up with this term. He's interviewed more than 50 astronauts throughout his career. And um, he's interviewed me before my flight and then after my flight, just to yeah. kind of like understand what I thought it was going to be like mm. and then what it was actually like for yeah. me. And it's honestly so much more than I thought it was because I'm very, I'm an engineer. So I'm, of course, skeptical about everything. And you hear about astronauts talking about it. You hear them say, oh, this and this, you know, the responsibility towards Earth. You see this thin blue line, all of those beautiful descriptions. And you're always in awe with how they describe it. Yeah. But then you never know, you really know what it's going to be like for you. Yeah. And because I just didn't know it would be this much, I knew because the purpose of my mission was to analyze that. So for me, I knew that it, something was going to change. And also because biologically we haven't evolved to see Earth from space. So of course it would be yeah. different. Like, yeah. of course it would be maybe somewhat of a psychedelic experience. Yeah. And that's what I would use to describe it before going to space. That it was yeah. going to be something like that. And oh my God. Mm. It was so much more profound and insane. Do you know what's crazy? Is when you come back and you, you want to talk about it, you can't really talk about it with anyone because no one's, you've only got 600 or 30 odd people who'd, who've experienced what you've experienced. So how do you like cope with coming back, literally back to earth, back to reality and trying to talk about what the experiences are, but knowing that the other person that you're talking to, such as me or the audience, they will never really know. Though it's quite, you're in a very small elite club, but... Can it also feel a bit lonely sometimes because not one, no one has experienced what you've experienced and it's very difficult for them to understand what you've been through? That's a really good question, honestly. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, really, because um, I don't really get asked that often. I think it's my first time getting being asked that and I think it does, it does isolate you. Um, when I came back from space, you know, you have this, I think the first two weeks, things were crazy, of course, and so much was happening and then you kind of you really want to talk about it because it just feels so confusing. You want to break it down. You want yeah. to talk about it. You want to understand why you're feeling the way you're feeling. And I've had um, some of my astronaut, other astronaut friends, they kept checking up on me because they have gone through that. So they would, you know, I would be telling them like, it feels weird. And they were like, yeah, yeah you're going to feel weird for a couple of weeks. That's normal. But you want to talk about it. Yeah. You want to kind of like, yeah. but then all of your friends kind of want to leave you alone yeah. because they think you don't want to talk about it. Maybe you've had enough because yeah. of, the media and all that. But then you actually do, you want yeah. to sit and, so you have your friends who want to be careful with you and yeah. not push you to, to talk about it. But then yeah. you need to, and yeah. then you're talking very superficially about it with other yeah. people. So you do get this period of, it did feel, it does isolate you. And, and it's weird because you do go through something that very, very, very few people understand. And then when you add on top of it being the first in your country, and the first in your region that also adds yeah. layers of isolation onto it because yeah. 
you have a lot more expectations. You have yeah. a lot of responsibilities. You have a lot of, you know, now you have to, you know, your life just yeah. flips upside yeah. down overnight. Yes. And then you have to, you have to adjust. And no uh, one teaches you how to adjust. hundred percent. And I want to talk about that. But before I do, look, we, in the show, normally I, I give my guests a chance for uh, a safe word. So in case there's a question that I want to ask that they, they feel uncomfortable answering, you get a chance for a safe word. Do you have a safe word in mind? Yes, it's chameleon. Chameleon, okay. Why why <laughs> chameleon, can I ask? It's a joke with my friends. Um, they Because of my line of work, of course, if I, I mean, if I do end up finding out that there are aliens or extraterrestrial life, yeah. that they want me to use this word to, yeah, yeah. just when I see them. Okay, very nice. So it's just a joke. Very nice. And your <laughs> mug. Talk to me about your mug that you have today. What's going on here? It is... Wonder Woman. Look at that. Wonder Woman. So t talk to me about Wonder Woman. What's the real truth here? I've always kind of wanted to have superpowers. I think as a child, I'm a big dreamer. And I think you can't work in the space field if you're not a dreamer. Like it's, I think it's the number one private, yeah. uh, you know, prerequisite to have. Yeah. And growing up, I used to always pretend to have superpowers. Yeah, I used to nice. spend a lot what of, kind of my powers? time. What kind of superpowers would you have? Ooh, there's this one. We used to, I grew up in Saudi. Okay. Uh, until I was seven. Okay, and so you've done, okay, so you've lived in Saudi. Obviously, you've got a bit of a U.S. accent going on a little bit. I'm sensing mm -hmm. now, <laughs> kind right? of a little yeah. bit. Uh, do you also have time spent in Egypt as well? Yes. So talk to me about how much time you've spent between. We'll come back to your superpowers. We'll okay. come back, but just so I can understand. So mm -hmm. Saudi, Egypt, U.S. Is that how more or less you've spent uh, your your time? Mm, well, there's a few years in the middle where I spent in Europe. So I okay. was born in Jeddah. Okay. Moved. Uh, when I was seven to Egypt. Okay. Spent um, from 2000 to tw 2017, so 17 years in Egypt, okay. and then moved to Italy for my master's, mm. got my master's degree there, moved to Berlin, worked there for a couple of years, for like three years, I think, and then moved to the US last, just last August, okay. actually after my space flight. Okay. Now back to your superpowers. Yes. So what superpowers did you have? So there's this, it's a, it's a really, it's a really funny one, honestly. Um, there was this show with these little, I don't remember what they were actually, there's these little creatures. Okay. They were living um, underground. Okay. And it was with my sister and like some of our friends yeah. in the Saudi. And they used to kind of drink this elixir. And yeah. once they drink it, they have all of these supervisors and they just keep jumping around. They save, yeah, you know, yeah. the, the, the other, their other friends or communities. And it was just so funny because we used to be in the park and we used to play this so often. Used to drink like pretend like we were drinking these elixirs and just like jump around yeah, and play yeah, around. Yeah. But even in Egypt, we used to always do things like this. I think I stopped playing pretend at an older age, like I think a little bit older than most kids around <laughs> us, which is a little bit weird. Yeah. But I think I've always had this imagination where I've always liked, you know, the the unusual things or just the weird things and. I think that's why I never really fit in anywhere because yeah. people thought I was weird, maybe, and people, you know, made well, that's fun what's of me for that. That's what's helped push you as well, right? That's what's yeah. kind of helped you separate you from everybody else. And, yeah. And your life, you're living the the reality of all of that. So, so let's go back to what you said when you went back to Egypt, right? So you've mm -hmm. you've gone to space, you come back, and you have this sort of superstardom overnight. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the the psychology of that, how you deal with that. I don't know. It's not something you don't really change. Um, yourself it's just like the outside changes but then nothing actually changes yeah. so for me in, in inside I just felt exactly the same except for like this new reality from the overview effect so my perception of the whole world changed my understanding this so it kind of going to space kind of breaks your reality and that's how I like to describe it because you have to really make sense of all the little things that you saw and how that changed you for, for me, let's say I was kind of like looking at how it felt to leave Earth and the feeling of being on the rockets and how how close space is because it doesn't really take you that long to get to space. How long does it take? A few minutes. Wow. So it's insane. And that stayed me with me so much. And I think so it's, hold on. So it's quicker for basically you go to space than it is for me to drive down Shakeside Road to get to my job. Yeah. That's crazy. It's quicker to leave Earth. That's crazy, isn't it? You leave Earth really fast. Yeah. It really is. You see the, the blackness of the world. You see Earth from outside really fast. It's yeah. That stayed with you because I didn't really expect it to be like that. Yeah. And um, 
and that stays with you because then you realize how how connected space and earth are that they're not really separate that we're always treating them as two separate things but then when they're really not so for me you have to like for me it was about dealing with all of this and then you have to deal with this other thing where you know you don't want to disappoint anyone you always want to you still want to help out as many people as you can but then you can't afford the time like you're very yeah. overwhelmed with this you're yeah. doing this and I have my companies I'm doing my PhD so you're always trying not to disappoint but then there's always also so much that you can't so you yeah. put so much pressure on yourself and I think also as Arab women we do that even more we put a tremendous amount of pressure on ourselves and I think I was talking to someone the other day about this um, about dealing with guilt like I have huge issues with guilt um like it's, it's it's a huge trying I'm trying to not feel guilty all the time but I think it's it's a big thing and I think it comes from how we grew up the responsibilities that we have how do you how are you with your family you know with your friends and because if you're so busy if you're trying to do so much you always want to do more but then you can't yeah so some things are falling but then you feel guilty about them yeah. so then this guilt just kind of translates into every little aspect of your life where you're always trying to do more yeah. still feeling guilty doing more that's tough. and that's, then that's i mean that's a tough cycle to break right you're you must be carrying a lot of weight on your shoulders. Yeah. So how do you deal with that, if if at all? I think it, you just have to do your best every day. I think you have to wake up in the morning and just tell yourself. I know you. I try to. I, well, the thing is, with other when I tell other people when they're feeling overwhelmed, I tell them, "Oh, give yourself grace. You know, yeah. just give yourself some space. It's yeah. okay. Things are gonna be okay." But then it's really hard to do that for yourself. Yeah, you literally did give yourself some space, though, didn't you? <laughs> that's what you did yeah maybe that's the solution just to not feel guilt just go back just like yeah. chill out for a few more months and you know yeah. see what happens to the world um look it's a really interesting thing that you're saying i think did do you have a lot of haters because of what you've done and because you're the first because you're breaking stereotypes like you said um and because you literally shot to stardom do you have a lot of people sort of hating on you of course <laughs> so how are you dealing with that side of being famous um well I tried to stay away from it so at the beginning it, I couldn't even read the comments like just I just could not go online and read all of the things but I would have let's say my sender my sister send me stuff or my mom so then that's how it, I would find out about what people were writing about me um but people just I think I understand why people were a lot of people were having issues believing that this was happening. So a lot of people thought it was fake. That, that, I, that you actually... Yeah, that I okay. didn't go. Oh, wow. Okay. So a lot of people thought it was fake, especially in Egypt. Um, a lot of people thought my company didn't exist, that I never got any of my degrees, that I'm not anything that I said I was. Which I think the problem comes from the lack of belief in ourselves. Because from our side of the world, it's really difficult to to see someone accomplish something and believe that they're from our country. So a lot of people also would say, oh no, she's not even Egyptian. Like she did all of her studied abroad and Egypt doesn't owe, like she doesn't owe anything to Egypt. But that's not true. I grew up in Egypt and I grew up in Saudi. Yeah. You know, I only moved for my masters. Yeah. So it was not that long ago. Yeah. But um, so I think it comes from this lack of belief in ourselves. Yeah. So it kind of translates into, oh no, there's no way some one of us did this because it's so difficult and to have the first person from the country to be a woman also that added to that it's a very sad reflection if that's the case right yeah Do, are you getting better with coping uh with these sort of comments or these you know these people does it get easier in time do you sort of form a stronger block if you like if i'm gonna be completely honest it took me seven months to to be okay with everything it took me seven months to kind of break the chains because yeah. it felt like it was always everything was so clouded for me oh I always felt like I wasn't doing enough yeah. which is crazy to think yeah. that I wasn't doing enough because I was I'm, I work yeah. I don't do anything else you know but um but it's it's, it's it, it was hard yeah um but I think I also got a tattoo that says stand in your power and it was because of that because you have to stand in your own truth and I have so much to give and I know 
that I'm doing my best. And I know that I've dedicated my entire life for space exploration and to push humanity to become multiplanetary. So I'm, I really am doing my best and I'm trying to make it accessible for everyone. So I shifted my entire, like I'm an engineer by training. All of my, everything that I've done was more technical. Now with my PhD, it was supposed to be, well, I'm working on spacesuits, but it was supposed to be more on the human spaceflight side. And now it's shifting into law and policy, just because there are laws that exist that make it so that people from with passports like, like passports like mine can't work in the field in the U.S. or in Europe. So I've shifted my studies into law, which I never thought I would do, to really make it more accessible. So for me, it would feel so hypocritical to just get the green card and just work in the U.S. Then what? Yeah. Like my company, the Deep Space Initiative. That's not what it stands for. It stands to break those borders. It stands to make it accessible for everyone. So I still feel, you know, going back to this guilt yeah. where if I'm benefiting myself and just doing this and, you know, I feel very grateful to have had this opportunity. I know that I can do more for myself, but then what? Yeah. What am I What am I actually doing? Like, I'm, I know what it's like to be on this side. So it's my responsibility to change it because if I don't, who else will? There's so much in what you just said now. <laughs> and one of them was about the betterment of humanity, right? I mean, how many of us can say that? What we do in our daily lives is to help improve humanity, is to help push the boundaries. Um, it's It really is inspiring. Everything, And I know it's a very cliche word, but what you're doing and what you're trying to do, even if you achieve it or not, the behavior, the practice of that is inspiring. What find, I find very sad is one of the greatest moments of your life going into space, come back, and then you have these seven months that you kind of have to battle through all the different emotions of it. So you have this incredible high and low. Do you feel now, since you've sort of, I'm not saying you're over it necessarily, but that you've moved through it, are you, will you become a better person, a better astronaut, a better engineer, more balanced? Like, talk to me a little bit about the experiences and how that's going to help you in the future, if, if at all. I think it does kind of build you. I think it does make you stronger because for me, it really felt like I, was, I wasn't I was meeting expectations of me, maybe because I wasn't sharing enough because of course you always, um, you know, it's really difficult. And I'm sure like you can relate to that, like you always having to share on social media or always having to share what you're doing. I really, I'm trying, but yeah. I can't afford the time, you know? You, I would rather do the work and let the work speak for itself. Like you could see how many researchers we have in the company. Yeah. How many papers have we published? Yeah. What are the results of that? Rather than me talk about them. Yeah. You know, I've always wanted to, the work to speak for itself, not me tell you about it. Yeah. So me not sharing created a lot of issues with people making up stuff about me, but also created also this other side where people didn't see what I was doing. Yeah. So I felt like, oh, wait, maybe I'm, I'm lacking here? Yeah. Am I not doing enough? You're not doing enough. So it's like crazy where it, it, the lack of visibility is, is, is bringing question marks on your credibility. Yeah. It's mental. Mm -hmm. Like why do we have to overshare for people to, to believe that you're actually doing something and you're actually focusing on what, what is going to ho hopefully help a lot of us out? Um, talk to me a little bit about your company um, and what you hope to gain from that. We are a nonprofit, so we're based in Colorado. It's called Deep Space Initiative. We do space research, education, and law. What we're trying to do is make space more accessible by providing opportunities. When I started working in the space field, if I if there was a job description that I was extremely qualified for, that I would be perfect for, I couldn't apply to it just because of my passport. So, which is crazy to think about, right? And um, so I realized, wait a second, I'm sure I'm not the only one going through this. So after talking to so many people, I went to conferences, I went to different events, to International Space University, like their closing ceremony, I was invited there and I started talking to people there. And because it's an international community, yeah. um, a lot of them wanted opportunities. And I saw how much they were craving it, how much they had to offer, but they couldn't put it anywhere, yeah. which is such a waste. It's yeah. such a waste. So that's why I founded Deep Space Initiative. And I started talking to people from, from NASA, from, from ESA, from a lot of different fields, and they, completely agreed and I got support from um well she was she's my partner in all of my ventures honestly she's an incredible incredible woman her name is um Dr. Jennifer Fogarty she was the chief of the human spaceflight program at NASA for 15 years she's 
one of the most, she's one of my heroes. And she's the one of the very first people in the space field who believed in me. And um, it's been incredible to have yeah. her, honestly. So she's the technical director of Deep Space Initiative. She's also working with me on this new venture too, this new company that is in okay. stealth mode. Okay. Um, I like that, stealth. Yes. <laughs> Great word, stealth. <laughs> yeah, I love the word too. Yeah. Um, so what we do is we're providing opportunities. And last year we had around 30 researchers. We were only like three people at DSI, like in the core team. And now we're a core team of about 20 something, 25, okay. 26. And we have in total 160 people. And nationalities wise, where, where are they all? Are they from around the world? Or mm -hmm. they, yeah. Everywhere in the world. So we're updating, updating our website now. So we're gonna have in the homepage, just a map to see where everyone is from. Nice. And it's really, all over the world Amazing. and it's so crazy to see the only difficulty with that is that sometimes it's really difficult for teams to meet yeah because yeah, <laughs> of the imagine. time zones yeah. but really we, we are trying to break to delete those borders because they don't really make sense so what does success look like for you then in that company in the ngo when i see those researchers we have milestone meetings so with the researchers so we get to kind of evaluate the progress of their research so we have i think we have 85 researchers this year and we're still recording more, but in this one Andromeda program. And um, so it's really, for me, success is how the team is working together. Like when I hear um, the head of the research department, his name is Smith, or the, the head of the education department, Victoria, when they talk about how much we've grown and how, and how much they love working on DSI. So Smith sometimes tells me it's his favorite thing to do throughout the week just to work on, D on DSI projects, on, on, on what we do, on, because it's such a, um, it's such, everything, everyone at DSI has gone through that. So yeah. we're providing something that we wish we had. Yeah. Every single thing we do at DSI is something that we wish we had. Yeah, it's almost like therapy. Yeah. Right? yeah. No way, yeah. no way. Yeah. Um, very interesting. And I wish you all the best in that. So, um, look, I've been working in advertising and marketing for, for quite some time, and, and part of the success of any company is about how you market the company, right? Is there a, is there a brand out there or an advertiser that you've always particularly liked? And if so, why? There is a really, I mean, there's a brand that I like because of its, um, I think, quality and functionality and how it makes me feel. And I think, I makes think- Makes sense, you're an engineer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a long come. Okay. I really like um, its products, to yeah. be honest. I love their, because I don't, I'm not really a super luxurious person. Like I don't really buy like all the, you yeah. know, the biggest brands or anything. I'm very functional. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I buy for function more than anything. I do love fashion. I do love, you know, I'm very picky with a lot of things, but also it has to be very useful for me. Yeah. And um, with Lancome, because of my crazy schedule all the time, the, 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 you know, how I use it in the morning, in the evening, I just love how the way it makes me feel. Yeah. It feels like I'm taking care of myself, which is yeah. always a plus. It's always a plus. And it always feels like my skin is really clean and, nice. you know, nice. We're not sponsored by Lancome yet, but uh, if no. we were, then <laughs> they should pay up. Um, t t tell me, um, how much me time do you have? Like, sort of block out all the projects that you're working on and, do you spend enough time alone? Do you spend enough time um, sort of nourishing yourself, making yourself um, feel better, be better? Not really. Um, so I have periods of super intense schedules like this one. Like this period is um, really hectic where I'm on travel every few days. Yeah. So I change countries every like three, four days. And then, so I have a couple of weeks of that and then yeah. a couple of weeks in one place. Okay. So, and then again, a couple of weeks of travel and then you like dubai sorry you like dubai i do like dubai yes yeah. you're gonna come back soon yes definitely amazing uh right in this part of the show i have what i call my bag of bulls okay mm -hmm. it's uh different topics that are related to your industry and we'll pull them out one by one and we will have a bit of a chat you haven't seen what's in the bag right mm -mm. you have no, no idea so we're going to completely idea. improvise this do okay. you like improvising yeah, i love it i mean as an astronaut you kind of have to think a little bit on your feet oh, sometimes yeah. you right have to. Stuff's going wrong. By the way, I was really hoping, just thinking about it now, I wish you said Houston, we have a problem, but you didn't say that. No. <laughs> I just, that would be, I've always wanted someone to say that to me in real life, but um, hopefully I'll get another astronaut one time. Okay, here we go. So, do you want to do the honors? Open up first? Sure. All right, I'm going to chuck this over. Okay. 
Let's read it out and I'll try and explain it. Okay. What is your biggest hope? I mean, that's self-explanatory. What's your biggest hope? My biggest hope is that we live in a world where if you say, like you can say, and it's just so normal that you're going to be working on the moon, that you're going to go to work tomorrow and it's on the moon and it's so normal for you to say like going to space is a normal thing and not a super crazy, you know, I don't want it to be this exclusive thing for only a few people in the world because it doesn't make sense. Earth belongs to everyone. I, I hope that everyone gets the choice to go to space, even if they don't want to, but at least they have a choice. It's accessible. Yeah. It's possible. For us to have a settlement on Mars. A settlement on Mars. All yes. right. Very easy. Right. Next one. Yes. That was quick. Mm -hmm. Next one. Let's see what we got. Star Wars or Star Trek? I mean, look, this is a, this is a <laughs> debate. This has been going on for quite some time. Where do you, where do you sit on that? And if, if not, if you had to choose, who, where, who would you choose? A lot of people are going to hate me for this. Okay. I have not watched either of them. You've never watched Star Wars or Star Trek. <laughs> Sarah. I know. Sarah, how? Know. How is that even possible? I know. I mean, you're talking about fantasy as a kid growing I up know. and dreaming. Oh. I know. I, I have to, I have to catch oh, up. Oh, I'm devastated. I'm devastated. I'm sorry. So I'm going to answer on your behalf. Okay, please right? do. Uh, Star Wars. It's it's the <laughs> it's the only answer. Uh, a New Hope is there. I don't know if there's a better single movie than A New Hope. Empire Strikes Back, phenomenal. Return of the Jedi, brilliant. I mean, these are these are movies that still stand up even now. Um, I'm a massive Star Wars fan. Mm -hmm. uh, I love because it's fantasy. It's anything can happen. Um, the types of characters that you meet, the weird aliens that you kind of end up seeing. Um, and it sort of stretches the boundaries of, of the possibilities of the human mind. So it's just an amazing fantasy world that I think as a kid and even as an adult, people just fall into. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that love Star Trek. I'm not a big Star Trek fan. Uh, more so the movies, I think, is probably better for me than the, than the series. But um, you have to watch it. I will. At least watch Star Wars. Not even the the new stuff. Watch the old stuff, the originals. It's just phenomenal. Yeah? I, need to, I, need to, I need to download if them. If you ever come back on my show... I'm going to make sure I ask this question. <laughs> and if you haven't watched Star Wars, there yes. will be trouble. Okay. Yes. All right. Chuck me the bag. It's my turn. Okay. Okay. Let's see what we got here. And you've got off easy so far. Mm -hmm. All right. This one is Earth. Is it doomed or savable? Oh. I'm an eternal optimist. I'm going to say it's savable. There's all, I'm, as an engineer also, I feel like there's always that something that could be done. There's no. I never take no for an answer, ever, ever. If someone says no to me, I'm always going to find a way. In, and it makes me want to find it even more. So and the same, it's the same thing here. I think it is very, very much savable. And everything that we're doing for the space field applies directly for Earth. So us trying to create oxygen on Mars, which we've been successful in doing. Moxie has been able to create oxygen on Mars using the CO2 there. So I'm going to yeah. pretend I know what you're talking about. Okay. So I'm just going to keep on nodding. <laughs> yes. So there's this, um, there's this machine so that it's, it's meant to create oxygen using the CO2 that is in situ. So on, um, on the, on, on Mars. And they've been able to do that recently. And they're still collecting data out of that and trying to, so basically to terraform Mars, which is going to take centuries, of course, yeah. but we're starting to do that. But you're talking about Mars. So you're already in your head. You've got a plan B, right? But it's, it's this planet. Yes, but oh, you can use... Can we, can we save this planet? Because it relies on human behavior to change this planet. So yes, from a technical perspective, you can bring in oxygen, you can do whatever from elsewhere, you know, everything can be saved, but it relies on the human behaviors. It relies on people wanting to make those changes. Yeah, and I do, I am still very optimistic about that. Okay. I always So no matter how, how pessimistic I am, you're still going to fight back. I like that, yeah. good. We need to I, be optimistic. It, we have to be, right? Yeah. Other, what, what choice do we have? We, yeah. can't, we can't really look at the world and say that it's doomed and then, because then you're not going to do anything about it. You have to see the bad things. Yes, do not ignore them, yeah. but then do something about them. And I think we need to be more empowered, just we need to empower more people to, yeah. to, to be able to take responsibility because one little thing can matter. One person can matter. And I think... You know, you don't really realize how powerful you are or how big of an impact you can have as one individual. And for me, actually going to space gave me that. Now I'm looking at problems, at bigger problems, yeah. and they feel smaller and they feel more doable. Yeah. And this problem here that we have, 
I think more people need to be empowered to, to be feel responsible because a lot of people are going to look at the, our day-to-day, -day, you know, problems and not look at this big picture, which is literally our future. Yeah. Earth is our spaceship. We don't have anything else. Yeah. You know, we don't, we can't breathe or live on anything else like, without, you know, extra. Have we, okay. So we, <laughs> we've been talking about, well, we mean you haven't, <laughs> but we've been talking as a, as humanity about how we need to save the earth for decades. We haven't done much or have we done much, but we don't know about it. Is it a visibility thing, right? So when we talk uh, as individuals, when we hear from our governments, we say, well, we need to do, we need to do, we need to do, but then we're not seeing enough action. Is that action actually happening? And yes, each one can have an impact, but is there a greater sway from certain countries, certain governments that they need to act more, they need to do more? What's your take on that? So. Well, there's a few parts to your question. So first, about whether or not it's being shown. Yeah. And yes, I do agree. The media wants to show you the bad things. They don't want to show you the good things because they don't get any clicks. Yeah. And with my experience from the media, you should take everything with a grain of salt. You know, they don't show you everything. Yeah. You know, they just want to show you what is going to make you click. Yeah. Have you heard of the book Factfulness? I have not. It's a really good book. Okay. So it really shows you the facts of how things have changed throughout the years, throughout the decades how much we have really progressed, how much, you know, the, the um, birth, giving birth, you know, how many women were dying years and years ago, how many yeah. are dying now, how many people have water, how many people have food, like what are the different stages of poverty, like yeah. how many do we have now, how many did we have before? Yeah. So it really gives you all of those facts. And it re it's a really, really good book that I highly, highly recommend. And it shows you how much the media does not show you these things. Yeah. And how, like, if you look at the line of where things are going, yes, there's a lot that we need to be doing. There's still a lot that we need to be doing. But actually, the yeah. line is going up. It's I think not that's going really down. interesting. I think that's really interesting. I think if people know that there has been improvements, things are you know, getting better, it would encourage them to think that things aren't doomed. There are ways in which we can save. So the role of the media now, basically what you're saying, becomes that pivotal factor. How do we get the more positive messages out there if the media aren't going to do it? How do we as individuals, what do we need to do more of? That's actually a good question. That's an important question. How do we do that? Um, how do we incentivize the media to share the good things? Yeah. Are people going to be reading them if they're good things? Or are they just going to look at them and be like, oh, whatever, you know, it's nothing that I need to pay attention to. But the problem is people love drama that's why you see them the movies the they human just, condition it's exactly. the human nature right you know people were as tribes people used to gossip and that brought them closer and usually it's about negative things more than positive things you know it's just part of our nature to be attracted to to the crazy bad things that were happening you know that's why it happened with me when i got my news um that people just like that you yeah. know it's more engaging it's more interesting so it's really, it's a difficult question to answer, honestly. And I think it's a very, very important one if we find a solution to that. Maybe, you know, having very unbiased media platforms where if someone really wants to find out the true news, then you can go there. Yeah. Because what I learned also is that you can't really change people's minds very, like if someone is convinced about something, it's really hard to change their minds, even if they see the facts <laughs> right in front of them, you know? So... I think it's about targeting those who want to know the truth. Yeah. So having those very unbiased platforms where you know where to find the truth, no matter what it is, and you go there yourself. It's not going to be something that is, you know, that is going to be very attractive to a lot of people, but it is going to be there to inform about the truth. So it needs to be a little bit more accessible. So everything that, you know, the book Factfulness talks about. You know, those, they need to be a little bit more accessible. They need to be talked about. Let's say we have documentaries. They need to be maybe put in a documentary. Maybe more people need to be talking about them. Yeah. But the problem also that comes with that is that if people see that, oh, everything is going well, they're not going to be incentivized to do better. So there is these two parts where, yes, you don't want to, you don't want to discourage everyone and say that the earth is doomed, but you also don't want to Give them, tell them that, oh, Pulse everything hope. is okay. Pulse hope, yeah. Yeah, everything is okay, so you don't need to do anything. So you need to have this balance, and people need to be making the decisions themselves. Yeah. But you're right, the human condition does tend to be <laughs> more on the negative than on the positive. It's easier to share negative news than it is positive news. Yes, clickbait, sensationalism, that all exists, and it's been driven by negativity. On on the, on the human condition, um, 
I know the earth can be saved. We all know the earth can be saved. If we all take action, yes, it can be. It's just whether or not do we believe enough. Uh, can we go from being doubters to believers? That's the, really the question. And do we have it in us, in ourselves, to really make that effort? Because we all know what the right thing to do is, but but walking that path is also something different. And I'm I'm seeing more and more um, this sort of polarization. Some people going extremely active, but they're a minority, right? But there's more of them there were than there were, let's say, five years ago. However, on the other side, it's like, you know what? I don't think anything's really going to change. Let's carry on as normal. And I just see that gap widening. What do you think? It is, um, it is widening. But I think, like I was saying also about empowering people to, to, to understand that they can do more. Yeah. I think it's about that, like it's the it's the belief in ourselves that yeah. we're losing. Yeah. It's about, I hear all the time people saying, what am I gonna do about this? You know, there's something that I all hear all the time, especially from people from in our side of the world, that's, oh yeah, no, but I shouldn't get into this. Even though I love engineering, I shouldn't do it because I'm never gonna have any opportunities when I, when I graduate. That's an example. Yeah. And it comes from this lack of belief in the system, yeah. in the country, yeah. in what you can do as a person. So I think that kind of translates into this, how do you, how do you empower more people to go onto that side, yeah. onto the activism side, onto saying like, yeah, we can do something about it and actually do something. See, I choose, I change the word empowerment to inspiring because right now, whoever's watching, whoever's listened to you in the past, uh, who's actually seen what you've done and what you've contributed, if you change one or two or 10 or 100 of those people to start actually doing more to help save this planet, then that's how you do it. You do it based on you, on, on, on the person that you are. And that's what people follow. People follow people, you know. Um, they get inspired by them and they want to be more like them. So my advice would be just to keep getting your message across as, uh, as, as wide and as far-reaching as possible because that's more likely to change uh, the drive impact. We need more people so, like you. Right, yeah, next question. You. Yeah, do you like my balls so far? Yeah, yeah I like yeah. that. All one. right, next one. <coughs> uh, okay, okay. Biggest life lesson learned so far? Oof. Biggest one. Oh, I've had a lot. I'm gonna chuck this lessons. back. Okay. I've had a lot of life life lessons. Um, biggest one. I have to choose the biggest one. <laughs> and you can give a couple. It's okay. I'll give a couple. Yeah. Can one is to um, trusting your instinct. I think I've been put in so many situations where my instinct was so right, and now I really don't doubt it. Like no matter what, I do not doubt my instinct. There's a lot of situations where I could have, you know, gotten kidnapped or I could have this happened. Lived a few chapters wow. in my life. That's another story, right? Yeah, there. those are <laughs> yeah. different stories. You nearly got um, kidnapped. Oh yeah. Where? Um, Where were you? In so there's a few stories. Do you want to get into the story? <laughs> I don't know. Do I? I don't, you tell me. Does it have a happy ending? I hope it does. It does. Okay. It does. Okay. I mean, I kind of ruin it by saying that it has a happy happy ending. Okay. But I was in Uganda for some time, and um, this. During a weekend, we, a friend of mine and I, we, we I, w I was volunteering there for some time. And then over the weekend, we went on this trip and um, we decided very spontaneously to go to this waterfall park. So we're like, yeah, let's go there. And you know, in Uganda, you have these um, bora boras. So they're like um, th these motorbikes where mm -hmm. you ride and then you rent mm -hmm. them and you, you go to places. Mm -hmm. We had like a sleeping bag and I had a backpack. So her and I, we both rode with the, boda, the, the motorcycle driver. Mm -hmm. And we were like heading in the, on the highway and it was so uncomfortable. It was actually like a few crazy nights. So we had a backpack, my sleeping bag in front of me, like a tent actually. Yeah. And she had also a backpack, so it was super tiring. Yeah. So this white car stops us on the side of the, of the, of the highway and um, he stops in front of us. So he's, the motorbike stops. They're like, oh yeah, where are you going? So we said, oh yeah, we wanted to go to this water park, uh, water, waterfall park. He's like, yeah, I work there, come with me. This random white car in Uganda on the highway in the middle of nowhere. Mm. Actually, like, it's not even a city that we're in. It's literally in the middle of nowhere. And we're like, um, um, I don't know. You know, you're stopped on the highway. He says he works there when we're not even near the water. <laughs> like it's like an hour away. Like it's nothing. Yeah, the warning signs are there. Yeah. 
And then, but we were so tired. And then we were like, um, okay. So then we have to pay the, the driver of the motorbike. And then he, and I, I think the bills were like, it's like 10,000, let's yeah. say. That's an example. I can't remember what it was. Yeah. And he needed like 2,000. And I yeah. only had the 1,000 or 10,000. I was like, I don't want to break the 10,000. Can you just take the 1,000? So the driver was like, no, 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 I'll pay for you. So the driver who stopped us paid for our motorcycle, right? So that's also a red flag. Yes. You know? So I was like, mm. yeah. But her name was Sarah too. So like Sarah and I were like, oh, well, he's really nice, you know? Okay. He's got a friendly face. He's he paid. Nice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's nothing wrong here. No, nothing. Yeah. Being stopped in the middle yeah, of the yeah. highway. Yeah. So we rode with the within that white car. I'll never forget the car. So we rode and then we we're like, yeah. So I'm, he's, he's like, yeah, I'm going to take. Um, and then, oh, yeah, he just like turns around. It goes the opposite way from where we were going. We were following Google, Google Maps and going this way. Yeah. And he turns around and goes the other way. Yeah. And we're like, mm, that's a little bit weird. You know, it's, what is happening here? Like, I thought, I thought it was going this way. And then he stops on the highway, drops a jug of something on the street, and then goes, continues. Nothing, no word, nothing, yeah. nothing, anything. Just in the, on the highway, takes the jug and drops it from the window. And then continues. Yeah. And you're like, oh my God, he's signaling someone. Like, like he has the, you know, he has the, you know, us. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's signaling someone so that he's on the way. So we're like, okay. So we looked at each other, like, uh, maybe this is a bad idea. What we just did, you know. This is the only point that you say. This is this is yeah. the first point you say. It's oh, a bad it gets worse. It gets worse. So then he's like, um, do you mind? I'm gonna take a shortcut. So we're like, okay. So he goes in the middle of a sugarcane field. Do you know what a sugarcane field looks yes. like? Yes. It's like in the horror movies. Yes. Where you're not seeing anything. Yes. It's huge sugar canes, yes. and you're going in the middle of it, which is only room for one car. And then he goes like in turns and beeps at every turn. And then at this point, I texted a friend. I'm like, look. I'm not I made coming a really, back. I made a bad decision. Yeah. If something happens to me, if I don't text you back oh. within the hour, just know that like I messed up. So her and I, we take our passports. We hold it in our hands. And we're like, okay, well, we need to be ready. Because he's signaling someone, obviously, at every turn that he's going, that we're coming, you know. So her and I, we held our passports in our hands and we're just sitting there like, okay, we need to kind of be prepared to just, you know, jump out the car and just run back. Yeah. So we're like, we're sitting there, we're looking at each other, we're like, yeah, yeah, just get ready. We're, we're getting ready here. But throughout this whole time, I did not feel this instinct where it told me like to run for my life. I felt so calm and I was normal. So my instinct here was not telling me to run. It was just my head that was telling me like, maybe this is a bad decision. But inside, I just felt like it was normal. Kind of trusted him for, for for some reason. It kind of felt like it was okay. So we go and like go throughout this sugarcane field. And, you know, we're kind of anxious at this point. But again, still, my head is telling me, like her and I, she was a little bit, she was a little bit more worried than I was. She was kind of freaking out. I'm at sure this if point. I spoke to Sarah, <laughs> she'd say the same thing about you. Probably, yeah. <clears throat> So we go, we go, and after like, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, we arrive to the waterfall, water par waterfall park. Yeah. He did actually work there. He was a really, really nice guy. He got us there. They welcomed us. There was like this, this amazing place, and it was like such a beautiful yeah. place, actually. Yeah. And her and I, we got there, we laughed yeah. so much. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of gives you a lesson, yeah. you know? Yeah. You know, even though... All of the data tells you this is huge X, X. You should yeah. not be doing this. Yeah. My instinct was telling me differently. But then there's also other scenarios where, you know, my instinct told me not to do these things. And on paper, everything seemed so perfect. And then months later, I would find out that if I had signed that one paper, I would have gotten so screwed over. And when I had gotten that contract like that one day and everything seemed per so perfect, I could not sleep at night. And I could not understand why, you know? So it also shows you the other way around where yeah. even though the data looks amazing, my instinct told me not to do it. Yeah. And I realized, I think like four months later, if I had signed that, yeah. signed that, yeah. it would have been really, really bad. Yeah. So it shows you both ways. Yeah. Where but in both cases, you're following your gut, <clears throat> right? Yes. And you're not listening to... And as a person, I'm, I'm guessing you're very analytical, you're very detail-orientated, you, know, you look at all the possible scenarios, but your gut overrides all of that. It's it like, does. Yes, it really, really does. So it what's the life lesson? What, what are we going to take from that? So don't judge a book by its cover, follow your gut. What's, what's the life lesson that you'd, what you, you think is, is 
is the biggest learning for you? Well, for the first story, I still recommend not writing with strangers. <laughs> <laughs> I still would not recommend doing yeah. something like this because yeah. we got lucky, honestly. Yeah. It could have gone really, really bad. It could have, of course, of course, ended up really, really bad. I mean, I, I was smiling throughout because I knew it had a happy ending. But yeah. I, I mean, had you not said that, it would have been a very different type of story. Yeah. Um, but yes, I think we don't realize, especially with, with like, for, an exa for example, when you're doing quick math in your head, sometimes if you overthink it, you're not going to be as quick with your response. But it's really weird how your subconscious knows the answer before your consciousness. Yeah. Conscious. Yes. Yep. Yes. And um, you need to trust that. You need to trust that you're actually gathering the data mm. all the time, but your your consciousness is giving just is putting light on one thing. Mm. So it needs it's not giving light onto everything. So there's so much going on in the background that you're not aware of. So I think you need to trust yourself that there is actually so much math and analysis happening out, happening in the background. Yeah. And you need to it, and it just takes time to put, give light on things. Yeah. And with life experiences, the more you things you go through, and honestly, you learn more from your traumas, from the bad experiences, meeting really, really bad people, getting screwed over. All of those have taught me way more than the successes or accomplishments or people saying yes to me. I've learned so much more from people having bias, like if, treating me wrong or all of this. Because then it, you build gather more data for your subconscious. It allows you to do the analysis quicker. And then it's just about giving it importance. It's just yeah. about realizing, hey, wait, no, I know I trust that analysis. The math that is happening in the background here, you should trust that. It's like a self-learning algorithm, right? You yes. keep feeding in more data, it learns more, becomes almost sentience in the back end. Your subconscious really starts to understand what's going on. 100%, really I trust it so much. This is the biggest thing I trust and honestly, gives you really good judgment about, especially in the business, in yeah. business, yeah. you know, if you need to make decisions on the spot, and sometimes yeah. you have to. Yeah. And um, as the leader, you have to always, you're never gonna be able to make 100% all of the good decisions, yes. right? You're never gonna, but you have to decide, yeah. and you have to be quick, and you have to, people have to be able to trust you, yeah. and to, you're, you, you're making the decisions with the data that you have, and you have to at least do it, yeah. you know? Yeah. And um, that helps you so much in that. And that's you're, you know that you're doing the best that you can. You're doing the best. You give. You're making the best decision that you can with what you have, and also about who to do business with, because yeah. that matters so much. Of course it does. It, Absolutely. It's, it's everything. Like it's all about people. Yeah. It's all about people. Yeah. And for me, that allows. That also gave me so much. I feel like gave me a lot of power in, in that side of things, in my entrepreneurship side, and who I do business with. Who do I? Who do I allow to be on the team or who not to? Yeah. Um, who do we partner with? Who who are in, who are, are potential investors? Because you don't want just anyone, right? Of so that matters so much. It matters how do they talk about other people? What are they saying? Like where are the red flag flags? So from one conversation, I can really know yes or no. Yeah. Like it's really really quick, and I trust that so much. And so far, I honestly am. Like one of the most proudest things that I've that I have in my life is Deep Space Initiative. Like that's my proudest accomplishment. It is the team that we have been able to build. The team at DSI, everyone's purpose of existing. There's this one other book that I read. It's called um, Five Rules of Leadership or Five Rules for Life, something like that. And um, they talk about the purpose of existing. And your purpose of existing needs to match the company's purpose of existing. And at DSI, from you know trusting your instinct from all of that you get to judge really quickly if their purpose is if Aligned. what they're saying is actually what they mean yeah. what are their motivations why are they doing what they're doing do they just want the title or are they doing this for the right purpose so it's it's all about the purpose yeah. and needs to match the company's purpose of existing yeah makes sense yeah one more what yes. do you think one more ball? Yes. yeah you like this yes i love this yeah. it's fun <clears throat> what do we have Scariest moments you've faced. Mm. Okay, so van driver gone. <laughs> uh, I, I, the thing is, when I when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, right, you've been to space, and it must be scary. You're sitting on the rocket, you're strapped in, you know, you're, you're getting propelled super quickly vertically. It's scary as hell. But I, 
But I always wonder, is that the obvious answer? Is there things that are more scary to someone you know, in the public eye who's been to space? Um, because it's not always the, the most obvious thing is the most scary. I wasn't scared on the rocket at all because- It's physics. Is it because of the numbers? Is it because of the, in your head, you know the, the probabilities of X, Y, and Z? And, or is, is that the reason? I, I want to understand why you weren't scared on a rocket. That's a big part of the reason. Okay. Like when you know, when you understand like how many things need to go wrong for, it's like, they tell you sometimes it's like, um, it's like Swiss cheese. All of the <laughs> holes in, in the cheese need to be aligned. Yeah. And so all of the problems need to be happening at the same time for you to have like this catastrophic, this, the catastrophic failure because you always have so many backups. You have yeah. the backup for the backup. Yeah. So I'm going to look at Swiss cheese differently now. Yeah. <laughs> so for me on the rocket, I really trusted it. And not only that, I think that's like, let's say 50% of it. The other 50% is that the, is the psychological training you have to go through. You have to be okay with yeah. death. Yeah. You have to be okay with whatever outcome that happens. Um, you have to sign away. You have to sign a lot of papers. You have. You're always told it's not without risk. You're always reminded. Yeah. So you know. You know. You know. But for me, it was always about. Well, again, going back to the purpose. You know, I was doing something that I know was my purpose, and um, for me, it felt worth it. And I think we see motorcycle motorcycle drivers. It's a really dangerous sport, but for them, it's worth it. For them, it's worth their life, and it's about that you know it's is it that your purpose do you think it's worth it and for me if I had died on the rocket it would have been worth it mm -hmm. I know it would have been really sad and I I, I of course I still want to go to Mars it's still I still have a really long way but it was worth it okay. and um and honestly when I was in space the the time that I spent there it's really difficult it's really weird to say but for the very first time in my life I felt like I was home so that also reinforced the idea that I was doing what I was here for. You know, I, I was, I am on this planet to explore space and I understand why humanity is doing this and it clicked. So going back to the scariest moment, it was not on the rocket because I was not scared on the rocket. But the scariest moment, there's actually one time while I was scuba diving that I was really, really scared. Um, I went on a dive dive in Dahab in Egypt and it was a very spontaneous thing where our instructor got changed into another one who I think did not have a lot of experience. I'm not sure. And I was there with one of my one of my closest friends. Um, she came to Egypt. We were there. We actually, like, she's Australian. We met in Madagascar. It's a whole thing. But she's my one of my favorite people ever. So we were there. We did a night dive. So we were towards the end of the night dive. And night dives are my favorite things to do one of my favorite things to do ever on earth, yeah. really, because you get to sometimes turn off your flashlight. Yeah. And when you have planktons, if you yeah. move around, you see like all of the little kind of like almost stars. Right. So you f it feels surreal. Some good diving in Egypt, right? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Best diving in the world. So towards the end of the dive, um, I think we stayed a little bit longer and we, had, we hadn't turned ba back around yet. And I was running out of air and we were still at like 20 something meters. And um, so it was still like, we would still have to do a stop because it was about an hour in and we still had to do a stop. And I was less than 50, like I was less than 50 bars, I think. So I was running out of air and we still had to turn back around, you know? So I still have, well, we haven't yet turned around. And I told the, the um, like our guide so that I was running out of air. Like I was kept telling her like, look That's at my- That's the sign? What's the sign like, for running out of air? On the water, there are signs, right? Different like this is like, oops, this is like, um, game over. Like, <laughs> this is like stop or something. Yeah. Like I kept telling her, like something is wrong. Like yeah. this is means something's wrong. Yeah. So I kept telling her, and I t showed my bar. Like I'm like, look, like I don't have a lot. And um, she said, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. She did this. She was super chill. Which as an, as a diver, you need to be chill. So yes, but I mean, come on, like yeah. I'm out of air. Like help me out here. So um, I started a little bit panicking, which is not what you want to do underwater, which is, was, a, was a mistake, honestly, because I didn't trust her. Yep. And I think when you don't trust that your person that you're with, with, I mean, with my buddy, I trust her, but there's nothing that she can do for me. Yes. So I was, I needed to trust her. But then when she completely ignored me and turned around and kept going on, continuing on that way, rather than turning around again, yep. you know, 
I felt like, hey, wait a second, like, what is happening? Does she not care? Like, yeah. what is going on? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I started panicking. I'm like, no, come on. Like, just, yes. like, let's do something. Let's go up. And then she was like, no, no, no. Like, it's fine. Like, are you kidding? So I started panicking a little bit. And that was really scary for me because um, it was completely dark. I wasn't trusting her. I didn't understand. Is she not understanding me? Did she not see how much air there? You don't have enough data in your mind from previous to understand yes. what, how things are gonna exactly. Work out. Yeah. Like, what is what do I do now? Do I take my friends like extra yeah. air? Yeah. Like, maybe tell me to do that. Like, I could do that with my buddy. Yeah. But she wasn't doing anything and just turned around and left me. So that's when I started panicking, and then um, and then like I had to like go up and I did the stop. Like she she came back around and she saw that like I was going up. But I was like, well, we need yeah. to end this. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to, I need, I need, I, I can't. And I think it was the psychological side more. I could have had a little bit more air to continue and maybe we have, could have gotten up and just, just, like, just swam back so on so the surface. You've got that helplessness, right? So yeah, I think it's this lack of trust that kind of made okay. me panic. Yeah. It's just her not giving me reassurance or telling me what the, what the next steps were. And when you're supposed to trust your guide or instructor, yeah. But I didn't trust her. Yeah. And I think it was because also before the dive, she wasn't really, I don't know, she wasn't communicating with us. She wasn't really giving us, like I've, I have, I've dived a lot, you know, I've done marine conservation for six weeks, like where we dived yeah. twice, three times a day. So I'm comfortable underwater. Yeah. So it's not like something that's new for me. Yeah. Um, and I've never had this issue before, but I think it's this lack of trust yeah, of that made me panic. That makes sense. Yeah. I'm sorry for that. Hopefully, you won't have that again. It's okay. <laughs> um, so sorry. Just quickly before um, before we wrap up, family life, personal life. So I know a lot was going on from a professional career perspective, but what about your personal life? You want to settle down? Want to have family? Any intentions around that? Um, I think it's really difficult with my line of work slash lifestyle because I do have to move around a lot, so it's difficult to be in one place which is unfair for a partner to ask them to move yeah. around yeah. around the world, right? Yeah. So I'm not sure what's gonna happen on that front um, yet. So, but I think it's not, my priorities in life now are my career and what I'm doing with the company. And look how happy you are. Yes, exactly. It's written all over your face. <laughs> you love what you do. You're super passionate about what you do. And I think it's, a, it's really amazing. There aren't enough people like you that have that just inner joy and, 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 and you are actually making a difference. When So when you align your passion point with actually the outcome, you're living your dream, literally. Yes. That's, that's what you're doing. Um, yes. So look, it's been, it's been fantastic, really. You, you're, uh, you're one in a, I don't know, eight <laughs> billion, whatever, 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 630 people have been in space, give or take, but like your, your incredible achievement. Um, yeah. you're, you're still very, very young. You've got your own company. You've got that you're working on your doctorate at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you've got so much still, I think, still to give, and that's the scary part. And based on what you've achieved so far, that I would normally say the sky's the limit, but you've kind of been there and done that. So <laughs> I really wish you the very best of luck, and I and I, and I really want you to keep inspiring um, people because you have a fantastic story, the real story. It's up to you whether you want to share that more or not. It's your call. It's no one else can decide that. Um, but from what I've heard and from what I've seen about you, I think um, they can only benefit from listening to you. So wish you really the best of Thanks. luck. I would love to have you back again in Dubai when your next visit. I'd love to. To catch up and um, go keep kicking some ass. Thank you so All much. Right? I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. And thank Pleasure. you for your kind of It's really Pleasure. means a lot to me.